So today we are discussing the edges of the universe because as it turns out, there's more to this question of, you know, than just like how much the universe has expanded since the Big Bang. Because you can also ask the question of, if we were to leave Earth tomorrow and travel at light speed, how far could we ever reach? How big of a universe could we ever interact with? And in this conversation, I chat to Toby Ord, who is a philosopher at the University of Oxford, who is trying to answer these really big picture questions. And if you ask these questions, you start to get a glimpse of just how huge humanity's potential can be. Just how giant our cosmic endowment that we've kind of been given is. And of course, on the flip side, how much we could waste if we were to go extinct, which of course there is a real probability of this century. And that's a topic that we also touch on in this conversation. So yeah, kind of high stakes stuff, um, but it's one of the most fascinating things, fascinating conversations I've ever had, and I'm really excited to share it with you all. So you wrote this paper uh, recently, or you recently published it, called The Edges of the Universe. And honestly, it blew my mind a bit because I always just thought of the universe kind of, I mean, I know it's expanding, but I assumed there was only really one way to describe the, the size of it. Um, but it turns out that there's many different ways. You've got the observable universe, and then you've got the affectable universe, and then you've got this the, the eventually observable universe, and then something called the ultimately observable universe, which it, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, so perhaps starting with the, the one that most people will be familiar with, the observable universe, um, what is that? And how do you go about calculating the size of it? Yeah, so that's the, the furthest distance that we can see. Um, so it's kind of, you know, everything we can see from here. And th there's uh, some slight wrinkles to this because um, uh, in the very first period of the universe, uh, photons couldn't travel very far. The universe was opaque. Um, so it actually is a little bit further than what we can see with light. It includes things that, that we could see with, uh, you know, gravity waves and things like that. Um, but basically it's everything that we can see. Um, and it's the, it's the kind of the distance that, uh, that light can have traveled um, from the Big Bang until now. Um, uh, so... Uh, that is not equal to the age of the universe, though. That's the, f the first kind of challenge in these things. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old, uh, but the observable universe um, is about uh, 46 billion light years in radius. Um, so it's about three times um, further away than you'd think um, that is the, the limit of what we can see. And the reason for that is to do with this expansion of, of space. Um, most of these issues come from expansion of space. Um, so uh, as the light uh, has you know, started, let's say, over here at the point of the Big Bang and starts traveling towards us, and, uh, and this is supposed the furthest distance at which the light could eventually reach us by our present moment, uh, the space between those points has expanded during the meantime. Uh, and so the point um, you know, that we can just now see uh, has actually gone you know, three times further away is roughly how it worked. In fact, it's, it's even slightly worse than that because at the very moment when it uh, emitted that photon at the time of the Big Bang, the universe was in extremely small and the point was actually very close to us. <laughs> uh, and uh, the photon that it emitted actually started getting further away from us and then kind of eventually made its way across uh, and, and reached us. Um, so there's some, there's some pretty complicated things going on there. Uh, but basically, it's uh, the observable universe is the, the distance at which uh, we can see things. Uh, and so it's of special interest to astronomers um, because they look out with their telescopes and they, uh, you know, they, they see what they can see. Um, but that's not, that's not the only kind of region you could be interested in. Right. So, that's, so the observable is, is kind of what... Again, yeah, this, this describes what we will ever be, the, all the information we could ever possibly learn about. Well, not, not quite, um, uh, because it's, it's what we can currently see. Um, and so, uh, so what I try to get across in this paper is, is that there's a whole lot of different regions around us, different spheres of different radiuses, uh, that, uh, that in, in conversation, people just say the observable universe for all of them. Um, they're not really aware that they're different to each other. Um, and so the observ observable universe is everything that we can currently see. Um, but next year, uh, the observable universe will be bigger. It'll be about one light year bigger in radius. Uh, and uh, new galaxies will be visible. 
Um, there's there's about uh, uh, 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe, uh, but there'll be about 25 more uh, each year um, uh, as as we can see further. And, and it's logical that as time goes on, you know, we can see further and further away. Um, but to do with the 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 rate of expansion is accelerating, um, and it's accelerating towards an exponential expansion. Uh, and what that means is that, uh, as it happens, the 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 um, the number of galaxies that we'll ever be able to see um, eventually asymptotes towards a, a number around about a, a trillion. Uh, and uh, after that point, uh, space is expanding so quickly that light from galaxies that are more distant than that, uh, than the closest trillion, um, we'll will actually never be able to make it. You know, it, it is kind of like slowly kind of moving through space towards us, but the space in between is expanding so quickly uh, that uh, uh, it never actually make it here. Um, so there is a kind of upper limit uh, to how far we'd ever be able to see, and that's the, uh, the eventually observable universe. Um, and what's that in, in light years? Uh, in, in light years, it's about uh, 63 billion light years. Um, so it's not that many more. Um, you know, we can already see 46 billion light years away. And we'll be able to yeah. see a bit further away um, as, as time goes on. And so that's also of some interest to an astronomer. Generally, astronomers are interested in what we can see now, not what, what we'll be able right. to see in hundreds of billions of years from now. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's still the, the same kind of project, right? You know, people with telescopes looking out and, uh, and seeing things. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll be able to see a lot further away. Uh, and I, I, should, I should add at this point, another kind of complication on all of this is that you might think, well, hang on a second, the universe is, is expanding shouldn't we be able to see further and further and further away? In fact, even the things that are currently 46 billion light years away that we can see, won't they end up further and further away um, such that, you know, if we can still see them, then now we'd be able to see hundreds of billions or trillions of light years away. And that's kind of true. Um, and so uh, what we can talk about there is uh, in kind of proper distance, um, or proper coordinates, uh, they are getting further and further away and, you know, they'll approach infinitely far away as time goes on. What do you, can you explain what you mean by proper coordinates? Yeah, it's probably just what you normally think of in terms of space. Um, if, if, if space expands by a factor of two, then their distance in this measurement will go up by a factor of two. Um, but there's another special way of doing it, which is called co-moving coordinates. And these are the weird ones. Um, but they're the ones that I'm reporting all my numbers in. <laughs> and so, uh, um, and co-moving coordinates are where you factor out the expansion of space. Uh, so if space is, has expanded by a factor of two, we just, um, uh, and we're still talking about the same galaxy, um, we say it's the same distance away. Um, so it's kind of like how far away would it be if we were using measurements as they are today? Um, even right. though we're talking about what we'll be able to see in the future. And it's relevant. You're, you're using like a frame of reference, that, like a grid that is based upon the actual physical objects within space. Exactly. As opposed to the this like point in space. Exactly. As, as a way of measuring distance. Um, okay. and, and so it turns out to be very convenient and about, you know, half or more of the stuff you want to do in cosmology on these kinds of distance scales, you want to use these, these special co-moving coordinates um, and... Uh, yeah. Otherwise, everything just keeps getting further and further away. But you find that when what you're interested in is something like, well, what kind of like proportion further out will we be able to see, or something like that. And the answer, you know, as I say, is, is the is the difference between 63 billion and 46 billion. So it's we'll be able to see about 50 percent further than we can see now in terms of the galaxies themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, uh, whereas it'll actually be some ridiculous number of light years, you know, uh, you know, quintillions of light years or, or whatever at different times, and you know, crazy numbers. Um, but those numbers just represent huge gulfs of emptiness, um, and they just are not that relevant. So, so what we generally do is we we factor all of that out, and we talk about like in in kind of today's terms, it's like an inflation adjustment, actually. Um, uh, maybe a, maybe a literal kind of inflation adjustment, um, where <laughs> where we're just uh, you know we're saying, well, in today's dollars, what would that be? Rather than saying, you know, your children will be trillionaires. And it's like, well, but will it, will it, will a trillion dollars buy anything? It's like, no, actually, they'll be living below the poverty line or something. You're like, okay, well, what's that in today's money? <laughs> so wouldn't, though, you know, we're talking about these insane distances and these, these galaxies right on the very, the very edge of what we, you know, we can see. Um, aren't these things going to get redshifted to oblivion? 
I, I, I presumably because one of the things you mentioned in your paper is that um, because you know we're we're dealing with photons that are like doing you know they're doing their very best to reach us but like they're really dealing with this expansion of space um wouldn't it appear that some of the that the galaxy is right on the very edge of of what we can see will almost like stop in time like kind of like an object falling into a black hole yeah so there's a couple of things going on there so one of them is that there's um is that space is expanding so uh, so one, the, basically the key to all of this, if you want to do the maths of it and actually compute these numbers and things, is something called the scale factor, um, which is just written as A. Um, and uh, the scale factor at any time uh, represents how much things have grown and shrunk. Um, and what we normally do is we say that the scale factor today is 1. Um, it's like today's units. It's, it's kind of like we we're saying we're, we're adjusting for inflation. It's, it's, like, it's actually exactly the inflation adjuster, you know, in, if you're doing this with currency. Um, and we set it at one for today because we want to know it in today's, today's units. Um, and in the very early universe, uh, this scale factor was extremely small um, uh, and things were much closer together. Um, and so uh, what happened is that if, if, a, um, if one of these galaxies that we can only just see now, like at the very edge of our distance, emitted a photon towards us, um, then that photon, its wavelength, um, you know, came out at, at a certain kind of pattern. But then that pattern has been expanded by the scale factor. Uh, and the photon has lost a lot of energy in that process. It's a kind of strange process where it can mysteriously lose energy and the energy doesn't really go anywhere, <laughs> as, it, as its energy is to do with its uh, wavelength, its wavelength gets stretched. Right. It's being spread out throughout space, I guess. Yeah. That's why. So over each unit kind of of area. Yeah, it's, right. it is weird. You'd think that, that it would be there'd be like each each bit of it would have less energy but there'd be more of it or something so by the time you absorb the whole thing you get the energy back but actually uh that doesn't quite work like that it's something i don't fully understand but it's uh th these things just have lower energy um there's there's some other mysteries like this to do with expansion of space that that conservation of energy doesn't actually hold in a universe that has this kind of expansion of space um it's it, it's not clear that you can exploit that in some manner to get the free energy out um, but the standard conservation of energy principles need to get modified. Uh, it's, it's pretty weird. Um, but uh, anyway, these things are expanding. And as they expand, they move towards redder kind of colors. And so that's one thing you can see is that uh, um, is, uh, yeah. And, and that's, I think, probably the best way to think about it rather than as a Doppler shift, like that it's moving away from you, um, like a, you know, a car, you know, going down the road, um, sounding like lower pitched. Um, but rather just to think that it emits this photon and the photon doesn't care about what speed the thing it was on was traveling because it still travels at the speed of light relative to you, but rather the expansion of space has, has stretched this photon. Um, and so that, that causes a redshift. Um, but there's, there's also another kind of, and, and that's why the things will, they will get redder and redder. You know, these things are the very limit of our vision. Um, but they, there's also a kind of temporal based version of this, which you kind of need a diagram to really understand. <laughs> but uh, um, if, you, if you take something, uh, let's say uh, something that's quite far away from us, say, um, uh, let's say 10 billion light years away from us or something. Um, uh, we can see that. Uh, well, actually, let's say something 20 billion light years away. Um, you know, we can currently see things at that distance with the Hubble telescope, for example. Uh, can, we can see galaxies at that distance. But we see them as they were in the past, right? We see them as they were... Um, uh, many billions of light many billions of years ago um, not quite 10 billion because of this expansion thing um, but uh, the um, so we see them as they were in the past and you could ask a question will we ever see it uh, as it is right now um, and the answer for something that's that's uh, 20 billion light years away is no um, we will actually never get to see what's happening there at this instant so what's happening there 13.8 billion years after the big bang at that you know that time. And uh, yeah, we will never see that. Um, uh, and you might say, well, then what, what do we see? Like if we just watch it, we, we record a video of that, uh, of that, um, uh, that galaxy that's 20 billion light years away. And we keep that video going, you know, over billions of years with our telescope set up. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe like we, we watch this video, you know, what on earth happens? Like, how can we not see it ever catch up? And the answer is that it, it, the video kind of slows down. Like if, if we had like high accuracy and we could see individuals walking around on those planets, um, let's say, we would see them getting slower and slower. Um, and uh, this is a, a kind of um, 
uh, I think this is called cosmological time dilation. Um, it's 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 not that they're actually going slower or something. It's just to do with it that um, uh, the way that the photons are kind of coming to us. Um, uh, Presumably, sort of fewer and fewer are reaching us, right? Like the 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 frequency with which they would they would be reaching us is is reducing. Yeah, exactly. You could think of it, yeah, like a frame rate, right? Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, every time the photons are kind of, you know, a photon comes off, it's a little bit like a frame or a little a pixel from yeah. a frame. Uh, and it's then, a snapshot um, of that moment. Yeah, exactly. And then those are just kind of taking longer and longer to reach us. Um, so it's like a degrading video connection or something. Um, you know, like a uh, you're watching some streaming service and the frames that it's giving you are slowing down and slowing down and slowing down. And there's some certain point in the movie that you're never going to be able to see beyond. But it doesn't mean that the movie actually didn't didn't happen. Um, just that we don't see it. And that's called so that's called the that that moment from which you 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 cease to keep receiving information from that distant galaxy is called the cosmological event horizon. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so this is how this, this usually comes up in astronomy um, or cosmology, um, kind of from this strange direction of saying, um, you know, how far away would you have to go such that you can never see what's happening now at that point? You know, so it's, so it's a somewhat kind of tortured way of, of and, and the fact that we're having trouble kind of comprehending this is, is, a, is a real phenomenon. Um uh, so let's just pause that that thread and then ask this other question, and then we'll see how they kind of line up, right? So a much more natural question, and a kind of the kind of question you know we, we've currently dealt with two of these different different edges of the universe. Um, one of them is uh, the observable universe, what we can currently see, uh, and the other one is the eventually observable universe, how far we'll ever be able to see. Uh, so, but there's another one which is the affectable universe. Um, how far could we ever actually affect? Um, and that puts the limit on how far we could travel and so on. Um, uh, if we could travel at the speed of light, then we could reach the entire affectable universe. Um, so, uh, and we can actually, we can affect this whole universe. Um, if you, you know, shine a torch uh, up into the sky, um, uh, then photons released from that torch uh, will leave our galaxy. And, uh, you know, our galaxy is not so, uh, there is some dust floating around and things, but there's not so much that, that it will block all the photons. Um, and there's not so many stars. The stars are relatively sparse. And so, uh, you know, photons will indeed travel uh, the entire uh, distance that they're, they're allowed to travel. Um, and uh, I guess if, if that torch was pointed in the right direction, at least, to hit one of these, uh, these galaxies, then there would actually be some, uh, you know, some influence that you'd be having on things at some extraordinary distance. And as time goes on, you know, these photons that you release from the torch go further and further. Um, and... In fact, if we're using the kind of not inflation-adjusted, you know, coordinates, just the regular proper coordinates, uh, then that that photon will go on forever, right? It'll get further and further away. And in fact, it will go acceleratingly far away because the, the space between it and us keeps expanding faster and faster. Um, so eventually, you know, it will reach, you know, any ridiculous distance that you care to name uh, from us. Uh, but the galaxies will also be moving away faster and faster. And so if you want to ask this question about, well, how far could it go according to kind of current units of, of you know, the kind of grid of galaxies? Um, and the answer is that it could go about uh, 16 and a half billion light years uh, from, from the Earth. Um, so it could hit a galaxy that is currently 16 and a half billion light years away from the Earth is another way to say it. Uh, and that is, but it couldn't hit one that's 17 billion at least according to our current measurements. So, um, uh, and this, the, there is a sphere, therefore, about 16 and a half billion light years um, across, which is about a third of uh, the, the observable universe's radius. Um, so it's substantially smaller. And in terms of volume, uh, it's, because it's about a third the radius, you know, it's about a 27th of the volume or something like that. Uh, wouldn't it be? Wouldn't the sphere be sixteen point five billion? It would actually be twice that, no? Because the radius is sixteen point five. So, so the diameter would be would be twice. The diameter. That, yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, that's right. Um, I, I'll do it all in radius, so we don't have to worry about uh, doubling yeah. everything and then halving and Makes so sense. on. Makes yeah. sense. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, so that's the furthest that we can affect. 
Um, and if we're trying to, you know, if we if we have our sights set upon the heavens and we, we think, um, you know, what are the limits for humanity? Uh, how many galaxies might we ever travel to um, or uh, or settle or, you know, utilize their resources for something or make some amazing art projects, you know, through through space or uh, or bring life to them all and kind of let them kind of, you know, evolve in their, their own world, independent kind of worlds or whatever it is that, that we want to do. Um, what's the kind of upper bound on what we might be able to achieve? Uh, then it's all to do with this affectable universe. It's not to do with the observable universe at all. That's just the stuff we can see. But we know that we, at least according to the current understanding of this physics, mm. that we'll never be able to reach most of that space. Um, so it's not the relevant thing. The relevant thing is the this affectable universe. It's, it's funny that you mention sort of because it, the observable universe is the thing we always hear about. Astronomers always talk about it, but that's actually a very passive thing, mm -hmm. right? That's it's about oh information that we can receive, but arguably it's more in, it's it's it, to me it's more morally interesting, more more uh, valuable to us to actually think about the affectable universe because that's something that we can actually have influence over, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, there's a few reasons why this has happened, why, why you don't hear about this. <laughs> um, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's the more interesting thing. Um, so one of them is just a general kind of past versus future bias, right? Like in, in, um, at universities, they study history, but they don't study the future. Um, uh, and the, the, the past is, is, you know, it's happened, it's kind of determinate, um, uh, and also information about it reaches us <laughs> and we can we can learn about it in a way that's very different to how we think about the future um, but also the past is settled you know we, it's not that we can go and change the past or something you know barring some time travel um so uh so you might think that why do we need to know about the past that's already happened and, and, and the reason you need to know about it is because you can learn things that are then relevant to the future um but you could also ask these questions about the future and what would ever be able to achieve and what are the limits, uh, you know, and some of that can be scientifically answered. Um, you know, what we'll do with these resources is a very open question, um, but trying to understand the limits of them, it's a little bit like trying to understand the limit of light speed or something like that. It's useful to know what are the limits, you know, in this domain that we're working with. Um, how large a canvas uh, does humanity have, uh, you know, to, to potentially paint on for the rest of its uh, existence? We don't know what we would paint, and it might be kind of more futile to speculate about that. But to kind of learn, you know, how large is the canvas and, you know, what are the colours that we have available and things like that are the types of things that are scientifically uh, doable. So that's one of the reasons. It's just a kind of past-future reason. Another big reason is uh, is yeah well it's to do with the astronomers and just that that they have these telescopes um, and they're mainly thinking about we look out with telescopes and we see things um, we sit at the top of this past light cone of stuff that's all kind of come up to us and we don't send spacecraft out to settle the distant reaches of space or something it's not something that we do in our field uh, maybe maybe people will do that in the future but that sounds a bit like science fiction to us and and you know that's perhaps why we got into astronomy in the first place due to dreams about these things but now we're serious kind of academics and we study the objective stuff that you know that comes to us um, so that's another reason but then a third kind of reason is that uh, that we only it, our understanding of cosmology, you know, keeps evolving over time, um, but and that this current understanding, which is called uh, that everything I'm I'm saying today is based on a thing called lambda CDM, um, which is the it's also called the concordance cosmology. It's kind of the most agreed simple model of the um, the universe that kind of fits almost all the data that we have. Um, and then there are various extensions to it, which are more speculative um, that people have. And some of those extensions mean that some of the things I'm saying would not be true if, you know, if, if they, these extensions turned out to be correct. Uh, and the lambda stands for the cosmological constant uh, that Einstein invented. Um, and uh, CDM stands for cold dark matter, um, where the idea is that the, the dark matter is something which is cold, which what cosmologists or astronomers, cold means it's not going near the speed of light. That's a weird, a weird use of the word cold, but uh, there you go. Um, if it was going near the speed of light, uh, then the maths turns out a bit differently. So it, it means that okay. the dark matter is... is Low energy dark matter. Exactly. Basically. So low energy dark matter and that there's also dark energy in this form of this cosmological constant, not some other form. Um, and so that's lambda CDM. Uh, that's the basis of all of this. On that model, you get a finite affectable universe. Uh, but when people were first exploring these questions... 
uh, people like uh, like Freeman Dyson has a has a fabulous uh, paper in 1979 um, that was one of the earliest papers really exploring this kind of what could ever be achieved over a distant time. Uh, they didn't know about this accelerating expansion, um, so they thought that the type of expansion of the universe was uh, was if anything slowing down, um, and if if the expansion was slowing down or if it was constant. Uh, then you can eventually get anywhere. Um, uh, and uh, eventually you do catch up with the expansion that's happening between you and the next galaxy, and you can always make it to the, to the next galaxy further on. Uh, and so on that view, there is a finite ob- observable universe at the moment, but eventually you'll be able to observe arbitrarily far because the light can make it all the way to you. And eventually you can travel arbitrarily far. So on that view... The observable universe, or the currently observable universe, is an important distance, but there is no eventually observable universe. It's infinite, and there is no affectable universe. Uh, it's uh, it's infinite, uh, so you don't you don't get these other spheres. Um, but so it was only uh, it's only about uh, twenty years ago that we realised that there was this accelerating expansion, and things changed, and effectively, the kind of you know the concepts or the the Wikipedia pages and so on have not caught up with this. Um, that the current view is that uh, is that you have this finite kind of region that's affectable, and then a whole lot of things follow from this. Um, so you've described so far the observable universe, the affectable universe. You've mentioned the eventually observable universe, um, which is oddly enough the, the if you add up the two the two. Uh, distance the, the two radiuses of the observable and the affectable you come to the eventually observable universe because that's the maximum possible distance um, in in co-moving coordinates that a photon emitted at the moment of the big bang can ever possibly travel um, that, that's right in terms of the, the further the furthest other point of something of, of, of a galaxy moving through space that that initial photon could ever reach but there's something bigger than that Right. That, that's right. So, so let's just before we get to it, let's let's just kind of like you've done a nice summary there. I'll just kind of add to your summary to just kind of like cement what we know. So, the if you think in terms of of uh, light cones, uh, which which hopefully many many people are familiar with, um, you know, in in classic flat space time, Minkowski space time, you've just got a a, a cone above you, like in, in the future direction, um, which is expanding, which corresponds to all of the places you could ever get to from here and when you could get there. And you've got a, an expanding past light cone as well, which is all of the points uh, in space that could ever have influenced you. And things that are in neither neither the future light cone nor the past light cone are things that are causally separate from you. They're events that, uh, um, that neither can influence the other. Um, they roughly correspond to what we thought of as simultaneous before we, before we knew about the special relativity. Um, and so... Uh, that picture has changed now, and if we do this stuff in uh, in the uh, if we do it in regular coordinates uh, where we we don't adjust for the the expansion of space, then things started off very close to each other at the Big Bang, then they started getting further away. Um, so if our past light cone this is, well, let's look at it from from now. So this is now and humanity at this moment. If we look at our past light cone, it looks like it's spreading out. But because the we knew at the start of the the uh, start of time things were very close together, it actually bold, you know connects back together. Things were very close again. It's kind of like an at the bottom of an hourglass um, shape or an onion shape. Um, and uh, and the future light cone starts going kind of up like this, but then eventually it it you know it it starts uh, expanding really fast um, and uh, this kind of exponential shape to it. Um, so it's it's a pretty confusing looking thing and it's not that useful for calculating anything. <laughs> so let's do it all again in these co-moving coordinates where we've kind of adjusted for, for the uh, expansion. In that case, the past light cone um, looks kind of like this. Um, and the, the base of the past light cone is the, uh, is the observable universe. It's the, the furthest back in time kind of things that we can see. Um, what does the top of it look like? Well, it doesn't keep expanding out like that, or otherwise we'd, we'd be able to kind of go anywhere um, at, at arbitrarily far distance. Because we can only go, um, uh, you know, this affectable universe, the top of it ends up asymptoting um, to a particular distance away from, uh, from the center, which is the 16 and a half billion light years. And the affectable universe is like the top of the future light cone, and the observable universe is the bottom of the past light cone. Um, 
And eventually, if we just stay here forever and don't do anything, don't go anywhere, we just stay on Earth for like very long periods of time, we'll be, time will be, we'll be really far up this diagram and we'll have this massive observable universe that we'll be kind of looking down on. And that's the obs eventually observable universe. So you can kind of tie all of those things together uh, on these diagrams. Then I said that there's this other one. Uh, and the other one is maybe slightly less fundamental than these. But here's a kind of question that, that comes up if you think about philosophy of science. Um, a lot of people wonder, what's beyond the observable universe? How could you ever know? Like, you know, uh, you know, could there be like a giant floating teapot, you know, just outside the observable universe that we would never know about? Uh, how could you just say that there couldn't be or that there wouldn't be? You know, is it unfalsifiable? Like if we talk about there being pink elephants, you know, beyond the observable universe or, or what have you. Uh, and it's meant to be a kind of challenge to, uh, you know, falsifiability or observability constraints on science uh, because, uh, you know, it's kind of saying, well, there's some kind of region where we could actually test things. And beyond that, um, we couldn't. Um, and now I think that there are things you could say about that, uh, you know, make sensible predict predictions about what will happen out there. For example, it's not that unreasonable to think it will be pretty much like what happens inside. <laughs> it will just kind of continue on in some kind of fairly homogenous manner. Um, but you can see that there's at least some distance that where think there's some interesting question that you can start to ask about uh, philosophy of science because you could ne it's fundamentally impossible to ever know or you know uh, find out about it. Well, that we've already seen that that distance doesn't correspond to the observable universe because if we just wait a year, um, you know we can see a bit further, um, and so you kind of wait longer and eventually you know we'll find out about that region that we were wondering whether it had pink elephants in it or not. Um, so that can't be the right one. Uh, and you might say, well, the, okay, the eventually observable universe is the furthest we could ever know about. Um, and that's true if we're stuck on Earth. Uh, but if we, um, if we just move, you know, uh, a light year in some direction, suppose we, we send a spacecraft to our nearest uh, star, uh, Proxima Centauri, and then uh, it brings with it a telescope and it looks out from there. Um, well, it's about four light years away from here, and it will be able to see about four light years further uh, in the direction that it went. Um, and so uh, it will be able to see, you know, new parts of, uh, uh, of the observable universe. Uh, and you could say, well, what's, you know, what's the limit to that? And the limit, the limit to this process is if we send something out uh, at very close to the speed of light, uh, and it gets to the very edge of the affectable universe. Uh, and then from there, it looks out. How far will it be able to see? And the answer is the radius of the affectable universe plus the radius of the eventually observable universe. So it will basically reach some other planet and it will see the eventually observable universe centered on that planet. And uh, so it won't be able to see more than we can see. It will just see a different, it's like it's the spotlight will be shining on a different part of this kind of wider universe. You use a nice analogy of being like on top of a different mountain. Yeah, you know, yeah. If we're exactly. on top of the mount, the mountain lo located in in ours. You know where we are centrally located, then you can climb and go to the top of another mountain and see further. But the issue is, of course, that you can't necessarily, as a single observer, you won't be able to see all of these different things because you are then you've got the whole problem that you can't move faster than the speed of light. That's right. So and you won't be able to communicate it back to Earth. Um, and, and this, I guess, brings us to a kind of particularly poignant aspect about these things. Just as the observable universe every year grows, right, it's kind of nice. You know, you can see further and further and further. And, and maybe there's some upper limit to how far you can see. But at least it's nice that things are getting bigger and more expansive. And maybe it turns out that, you know, people are slowing down or whatever. Like the galaxies you see, you don't see their entire, like, temporal extent. You only see the first part of it. And so the frame rate starts to drop and so on on, on these other galaxies you're looking at. Uh, they also end up getting kind of redshifted and, and dimmer for various reasons, you know, basically because there's fewer and fewer frames being sent to you, uh, which corresponds to getting dimmer. Um, okay. Um, but, it, okay, so that's a little bit depressing in some ways, but it's also somewhat, you know, expansive. Uh, but the affectable universe is shrinking uh, at the same kind of rate in terms of light years per year. It's, at the moment, because of how we've normalized everything, it's shrinking by one light year per year. Um, and the other one's growing by one light year per year. Uh, so if we if we wait and we just fritter away our time on Earth, um, the affectable universe gets smaller and smaller. And there are galaxies uh, that are slipping kind of beyond our reach. Uh, every year, 
Uh, yeah, it's every three year. Three per year, right? Th- yeah, three galaxies per year uh, slip beyond our reach. Uh, so the more we delay, uh, the the smaller the um, the canvas uh, that we have to, to paint on. Uh, so, and, yeah. Um, and is this... Is this because to me that seems like uh, an enormous tragedy, like a, literally a tragedy of astronomical scale? Because, um, I, I mean, I personally believe that we're, we're quite likely to be the only um, uh, advanced civilization within our observable universe. And so I'm a big fan of spreading consciousness. Uh, I think consciousness overall is a good thing and we should have more of it. And, you know, what what this is suggesting is that every every moment that we wait, we're losing stuff with which, you know, matter and energy with which we can use to make more consciousness. Um, yep. So it, it creates a kind of urgency, a, a moral imperative to to get a move on and start spreading through space. Yeah, I mean, uh, th- that's right. It's 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 huge. I mean, it, it an entire galaxy uh, uh, every uh, every year. <laughs> I mean, it, well, three galaxies. It's, it's, uh, it's almost kind of beyond the ability to, to comprehend. Um, now I should say that not all galaxies are created equal, um, and we we live in a, a fairly large galaxy. Uh, there are ones that are bigger, but I think I don't know what the fraction is, but something like ninety percent or more are smaller. And so some of these galaxies, you know, might be some very tiny ones and so forth. Um, but you know, that's that's a rather unusual like approach to kind of like three galaxies per year are leaving our our reach, and it's like, well, they're small galaxies. Well. Some of them are small, but you know, occasionally you lose a big one as well, um, and uh, and even the small galaxies are pretty big by by regular standards. Um, and I guess I could say just a tiny bit here about the 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 physical structure of all of this. We, we've been talking basically everything I, I talk about in in the paper and that we've talked about here. The units are basically billions of light years and billions of years. Um, nothing really happens on a time scale <laughs> smaller than a billion years or a billion light years. Um, when I've kind of you know worked on this with other colleagues, yeah, we often just use units of uh, yeah giga light year, giga years, and so on. Um, uh, and at that scale, space like the the matter in space is relatively homogeneous. Um, uh, so the you know, you're familiar, I'm sure everyone's familiar with uh, with solar systems um, or planetary systems, as they're called, if they're not centered around the, the sun in particular. Uh, and then also galaxies, um, where you've got a whole lot of um, a whole lot of stars orbiting the, the center of a galaxy. Uh, but beyond that, um, you've got groups of galaxies or clusters of galaxies. Um, basically, it's a bit confusing, but clusters turns out to just be the name of a big group of galaxies. Um, they're not really a separate scale. Um, uh, and the our galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, is part of about uh, fifty to fifty to one hundred galaxies um, called the local group, and it's the second biggest. Uh, Andromeda is the biggest, uh, and so that's 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 the local group. Um, and these are gravitationally bound. Uh, that means that that the space between them is not really expanding. Um, that effectively the gravity is strong enough to pull them in. Uh, in a way that overwhelms the expansion of space, so the distances don't blow up to infinity as time time goes on, and that means that we'll we'll always be able to access the the local group, um, which I think the current count is fifty five of these galaxies. Uh, so there's fifty five galaxies that we'll always be able to reach, no matter how slow we are. Uh, but the others, uh, the, all the other groups and clusters, will be separated, and eventually each each of these groups or clusters is separated from each other one. Um, and uh, and so the observable universe, sorry, the affectable universe, eventually shrinks down to basically just your own your own group, um, unless you can have you know spread out such that you've reached many other groups and clusters. There are different things Match you could on. yeah, there are different things you could do. You could attempt to actually bring them back to a, a local place in order to kind of um, let's say paint you know a, a a painting that has a whole lot of internal coherence and involves kind of, you know, like, or perhaps more, more plausibly, may, maybe you want to build some giant computer structure or, or some kind of society that involves lots of interconnections and causal interconnectedness. Mm-hmm. In that case, you could exceed, the, you know, what you could do with a single uh, a single cluster by by bringing more matter together. Um, you, could, you could, in theory, go all the way out to halfway to the edge of the affectable universe. Um, that's the distance, that's the point of no return distance that you could ever get back to the Earth from and then start mm-hmm. bringing the stuff in between back to Earth. Um, or you could just do a kind of, um, you know, maybe it doesn't all need to be causally connected. Um, 
it can you can uh, have different projects that go on in every different cluster. Maybe they're all kind of coordinated in some way. Um, you're all painting pieces of a kind of great uh, uh, painting that will never be assembled in one place, but is somehow all coherent. <clears throat> or you could uh, uh, you could just let them do whatever they want, um, because ultimately, after a while, they'll never be able to affect each other again. Uh, and so you could have a kind of libertarian future where, where each group gets to kind of choose what it wants to do and doesn't actually have to be part of a unified whole. So tell me why it is that you are working on these sorts of questions, because I can imagine a lot of people find them, you know, it's, it's fascinating, but they're like, this seems a little bit abstract. And, you know, you're a researcher at the Future, future of Humanity Institute, um, which focuses a lot on sort of ethical dilemmas and, and um reducing existential risk. So what's what's your motivation behind the work, this particular work? So in part, it is just curiosity. Um, this is something where I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting stuff, basically. Uh, and I, I came to it in part from just trying to understand how does this past light cone actually work and this future light cone in an expanding universe with a big bang and so on? Um, you know, is it the case that that past light cone eventually curved back on itself and touched, touches or something? You know, what, what was going on there? And I just kept trying to find out more and more about it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in it because I'm interested in humanity's potential. Um, so in general, we know of very few uh, limits on what we might ever be able to achieve. Uh, so uh, one such potential limit comes from the habitability of the Earth. Uh, the current guesses on this are that in somewhere between about 500 million years and one and a half billion years, uh, the Earth, due to the sun's ex uh, warming and expansion, the Earth will warm uh, sufficiently that it'll be very difficult for complex life to continue to exist. Uh, and this is sometimes put as an upper bound on what we'll be able to achieve. But, uh, the, you know, it, it, the sun doesn't get warmer very quickly. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're planning, you know, currently the breakthrough star shot and things, you know, there, there, are, there are missions planned to go to other stars, you know, leaving in the next uh, few decades. Uh, so the idea that somehow billions of years have elapsed and we're still stuck on Earth and we're, we're struggling with the temperature getting too hot is a bit of a weird kind of limit. Uh, Se yeah, it seems implausible. So then you start to ask about, well, you know, what are the duration limits? Like how long will there be stars shining for? Uh, and the answer to that is that there'll be naturally burning stars um, uh, going for something in the order of 10 trillion years. Uh, the, the new stars will still be being created up until about 10 trillion years. And some of the longest burning, very dim stars, though, um, last for about 10 trillion years. Uh, so, you know, 10, 20 trillion years into the future, they'll still be naturally burning stars. But then there's also going to be this kind of strange forms of star formation where big clumps of hydrogen gas um, that were not quite big enough to burn uh, to, to fuse, um, where two of them eventually, due to random effects in a, in a galaxy with 100 billion stars, eventually two of them collide and have just enough fuel to burn for another 10 trillion years. And this kind of process will, will carry on um, for, for much longer, I think thousands of times longer. Uh, so there will be stars burning in you know, the Milky Way for, um, uh, for, I think it's quadrillions of years. So very, very large, you know, you need scientific notation at that point, very long periods of time. Um, but then also, you know, how far could we ever affect, you know, like how much, how many stars could we reach? It, these are very natural questions. If you're just trying to understand, can we say anything about the upper bounds to what we might be able to achieve? Uh, and, I. Uh, and then you start to get into these questions about how far could we ever go? Is that the observable universe and so on? So I kind of got intellectually curious about this, but also that curiosity was driven because I take seriously that we will have a future. Uh, and I think that there's a very realistic chance, let's say greater than five or 10% or something, that that future will involve um, uh, traveling as far as we can through space uh, with some kinds of projects uh, that that rather than that we find ourselves in this vast world and that we never actually explore it. We just forever, <laughs> repeatedly fail to explore it. And uh, that, that seems possible. Maybe we'll make some decision to never explore it or something and we'll, we'll bind that into some constitutional law so that no kind of <laughs> curious no people ever come up and try to explore it. Um, I don't know why we would do that. It seems it seems misguided. I mean, there, are, there seem to be people on Earth alive today who are very anti the idea of 
even the Mars mission. Like, yes, yeah. I, I find it mind boggling. And I think it's it speaks for just a lack of imagination on their part and probably some other weird. <laughs> so, so we might personality have something. traits, but yeah, <laughs> we, we might have something like that. That, um, But it seems very plausible to me that as time goes on, you know, that and the, the relative costs of doing these things become cheaper and cheaper. Uh, that eventually we'll we'll do it. Uh, in which case, that will be a very big deal, like a very a very big thing going on in the universe. Um, and in fact, if we did explore like that, the the largest known structures in the universe, basically the largest structures. I mean, cosmologists just refer to this as the the, the largest structures, are at about a scale of um, uh, about a billion light years across. Um, the cosmic voids. Um, so beyond the scale of these these groups and, and clusters, they're arranged into these filaments, these very long kind of s- tendrils of stuff that's in, that's in this what's called the cosmic web, where you can imagine various kind of brightly shining points with kind of slightly dimmer um, uh, ones of these uh, filaments connecting to other brightly shining points. And each point has several that come off from it in a kind of three-dimensional web. And uh, uh, th- these there's these kind of one dimensional filaments. There's these kind of zero dimensional brightly shining points that are particularly dense with galaxies. And sometimes those points are called superclusters. Uh, and uh, although eventually this whole web will disperse and be stretched apart by expansion. So it, it, this, this is current structure, but it won't last forever. And these voids, these kind of three dimensional regions between them are the biggest things. And uh, the biggest ones of those that have been discovered are uh, about a billion light years across. So, uh, and there's reason to think that you can't get bigger than that in terms of uh, to do with like how much time there has been, how much time there'll ever be, and the force of gravity versus the force of expansion and so on, that these are the largest right. structures that will naturally arise, naturally arise where you rule out intelligent organization as part of what's natural. Uh, and so that's how it's normally thought of. Um, but actually, it seems that we could create structures which are larger than any other structures in the universe, um, because the affectable universe is, you know, is many times larger than one of these these regions. Uh, so it could actually be that that, uh, I mean, it, it would be it would be enough, I think, if. Uh, humanity was special despite the vast scales of the universe by being some very fragile and very complex kind of arrangement of things around the surface of planets and so on, which has this kind of ability to know the universe as a whole and to, to love and to feel and, and so on. Uh, but it could also be the case that even in terms of raw scale, um, that humanity uh, ends up being uh, able to kind of orchestrate things on the largest, uh, larger scales of anything in, uh, in the reachable parts of space. I think a, a common pushback that many people who are sort of skeptical of, of the importance of us examining the, you know, and exploring the affectable universe is that they have very strong beliefs that there are already alien civilizations out there. There is already consciousness. We just haven't seen it yet. Um, what would you say to that argument? So I think this this often comes from just the sheer number of stars um, where people, um, I, I guess there's a couple of reasons. One of them is the sheer number of stars. I think this is not a good argument. Um, uh, it's true that there are a lot of stars. And if you haven't seen a number like 100 billion before, you know, you tend to think it's just so big. Um, uh, but there are numbers that are, you know, comparatively small. Um, you know, there are probabilities that are less than one in uh, 100 billion. Um uh, you know what? A hundred billion is uh, is ten to the power of eleven. Um, so, if uh, if you roll a ten sided die eleven times, you know the chance that that you get a one every time is is the same. You know, is that is the mm-hmm. inverse probability of that number of things? Um, could it be that in order to create the first self replicating uh, molecules, you need to do something that is a, that is less likely? Uh, than rolling a ten-sided die, um, you know, say twenty times, and getting in a, row, a one every, t- yeah. and getting a one every time, seems entirely plausible, especially as the the smallest known uh, um, structures of DNA or RNA um, that are self-replicating are, are quite long, <laughs> much longer than than twenty base pairs or or hundred base pairs, uh, and we don't know. It could be that there are a whole lot of um, catalysts and things that that help those first ones get created through systematic processes where it doesn't have to be done kind of you know randomly or something uh but we don't know about that it's very plausible that actually to get to the first point where where um, you get something that's self-replicating you need a, a combinatorial thing you know some arrangement of these base pairs maybe the smallest arrangement that actually works is really quite long 
Um, and then that could give you extremely small probabilities, you know, probabilities like, you know, one in a Google or something like that. There's one in 10 to the power of 100. If there's, if there's what, four base pairs, then and suppose you need um, uh, 200 of them uh, to have the small, in the right combination to have the smallest thing, then that probability, you know, is less than one in a Google. Uh, so uh, there could be some steps like that uh, that are needed in order to get to, uh, to be an intelligent uh, civilization on a planet. And I think the origin of life is the most plausible one to have extremely low probability. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh, I wrote a paper with, uh, with Anders Sandberg and uh, Eric Drexler on this, uh, where we consider our ignorance uh, about this, that it's very plausible that this, the probability of getting to where we are is extraordinarily low. Um, and it's very plausible that, that it's a number that's correspondingly, it's smaller than the number of stars in the observable universe is big. Um, and such that if you multiply them together, like the chance of getting life around any particular planet by the number of planets, that you indeed find that, uh, that you should expect less than one per, per region of this kind of size. Um, and uh, then when we look out at the, the night sky and we look out with our telescopes and so on and we don't find any, any evidence of any kind of structure or life or any observable effects anywhere, uh, I rather than treat this as some kind of paradox, it would only be a paradox if we had some very strong reason to think that there really should be. But if we start off with the view that, oh, it's entirely plausible that we're completely alone, and it's also entirely plausible that actually it's it's pretty common and, uh, and that it happens regularly around different stars. You look up at the, the, the night sky and you see no evidence of any life and you think, oh, I guess it was, I guess it was unlikely then, um, mm. is, is the response. I think it's partly because people assume that because we exist, it's therefore statistical proof or very strong statistical evidence that life is easy to create but actually if, if we had another data point just one other data point somewhere independent i don't think mars counts because actually mars you know if we find like my life on mars arguably mars and earth were sort of formed out of the same soup right but like if we did find evidence of of life elsewhere outside of our solar system now all of a sudden the probability will go up massively but our mere existence because it's only one data point doesn't actually give you any meaningful information about the probability is that correct yeah that's right um and it's it's easy to fall into that trap of thinking that it does uh, but ultimately um you know uh, once you get intelligent life it will look around and find itself on a planet where life started. Um, it will always see that. It can't see anything else. Um, and if you have a situation where there's only one type of evidence that you could see and there's no other evidence that you could see, then that evidence doesn't actually count. Um, it, you know, it, you, can, you can do that more complicatedly with the probability theory and Bayesian statistics and so on. But basically, um, yeah, if there's only one thing you could observe, uh, <laughs> uh, regardless of how an event turns out, then it doesn't tell you anything about the probability of that event. And that's what's going on here. Uh, in, in our paper, we actually have these elaborate appendices where, we, where uh, I think Anders has uh, calculated out for different things like finding, um, you know, uh, intelligent life somewhere else on a different star and, and or even a different planet in our solar system and so on. What would this do to this kind of prior distribution of probabilities of, uh, of life arising and so on and has, has tried to kind of pre-calculate what all the updates would be if you were to get these pieces of evidence. Um, so that's that's if people are interested in that they, they can find out more about it um, oh, and and I think it's below. I think this is also a case of the Copernican principle kind of going wrong and I think that this is something where you know pre Copernicus the, the idea was at least in the West uh, that we thought Earth was special and humanity was very special um, and a kind of teleological view that it was all created for us with a kind of purpose and so on and that we were at the center of the universe and so on and so forth uh, and then uh, Copernicus you know uh, had a had a had a more successful scientific model by putting the Earth not at the center of uh, the universe, uh, but in particular going around the sun. I guess it's open question whether the sun then had to be at the center of the universe or not, and you know, it didn't. Um, and I think that scientists have over-updated on this, this rule. They thought, oh, that's very successful uh, to assume that we're not the be-all and end-all, and in fact that we're in some very typical or mediocre position, and it's sometimes called the principle of mediocrity, to assume that we're basically in a typical position. And I, I think that the correct version of this is you need to account for selection effects. So as an example, this would predict we're at a typical point in space, which would suggest that most points in space or like half the points in space are near the surface of planets. Uh, but actually, almost no points in space, even near the Earth, are near the surface of the Earth. They're either inside the Earth or hopelessly far up in space. 
um, and then almost all points in space are nowhere near a planet. They're not even in a galaxy. They're in one of these cosmological voids. Um, and yet we don't find ourselves in a void. We find ourselves in an extraordinarily special place, and we know that. Um, and so basically you you need to say something, a, a modified version, not just that we're mediocre on all attributes, but rather we're in a typical place among the places we could possibly find ourselves or something like right. that. And, uh, um, and so once you adjust for that, the, this kind of mediocrity assumption or Copernican assumption doesn't suggest that it's typical that life should evolve around a planet, um, you know, any old planet. It just says that we should find ourselves in a typical place where life evolves, which, which, which would suggest, for example, that, it's, that a decent fraction of life that evolves in the universe evolves on the surface of a planet. Because if almost all of it evolved in cosmic voids or something, it's a bit weird that we don't find ourselves there. So you can still get something out of this principle, but not what these people thought, which is that most worlds would probably be habitable and inhabited. Yeah, it's almost like a anthropocentrism, you know, the idea that we are mm -hmm. in some way special became... It, because of the, the 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 ways in the Middle Ages, which were so they were so anti anyone who would suggest that the Earth wasn't the center of everything, um, it, it became science became attached to this idea of that we must be uh, of anti specialism um, and anti anthropocentrism. But it actually sounds like there was some element of truth to that that we actually might yeah. be quite special. Yeah, that's right. Um, but it, it's it's ultimately been you know um, you know hundreds of years of overreaction you know it, it feels like at some point in the intervening centuries we should have settled out to the correct level of um you know of skepticism of, of these kind of theories that we're special uh but we have not yet achieved that there's still this kind of reaction um that you get uh where it's where you don't want to be confused with the other side in the in, in galileo right. versus the the church or something and yeah. instead of saying well there's no possible chance anyone could confuse me with the other side of that why don't we just adopt a more neutral stance on this and I think it's quite beautiful, actually, if there ends up being that there's an element of truth from the church side and there's an element of truth from the mm. from the science side. And, and in reality, as with all these things, the answer is a bit more complex. Um, given, given this, that we might be alone, uh, might well be the only conscious consciousness in the universe. You actually wrote a book recently uh, called The Precipice, which talks about the likelihood that we might go extinct in the coming in the coming century um and the answer that you came to is is one of the most terrifying numbers i think i've ever ever seen uh that we have a, a one in six chance so again talking about dice you know what like rolling a one on a dice is the probability that we don't just have a huge catastrophe on earth where only a few people are alive but literally every every human being possibly every in form of intelligent life on earth uh animals included goes extinct um what the hell? How, did, how, how can that be the case? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I hope I'm wrong about this. There's <laughs> one thing to say. Um, so, uh, so what I'm looking at in, in that book, The Precipice, is existential risk. Um, so this is the, the chance that we have an existential catastrophe. Um, so this is a, a kind of term of art. And what it means, it includes extinction, uh, the scenario you talked about. But it's a little bit broader than that. And maybe some of my probability goes into these other scenarios. Uh, because it, it also includes um, if there was an unrecoverable collapse of civilization. Uh, and it also includes uh, kind of dystopian futures um, that are permanently locked in. Uh, so a kind of world like uh, Orwell's 1984 um, that, uh, that was self-supporting and uh, you know, had all this apparatus built in such that this kind of oppressive totalitarian regime could never be overthrown. That would count as well. And, and what these things have in common is that humanity's kind of once vast potential um, has been reduced to either just one future, the future of just, you know, um, like where there's no actions humans can take anymore. It's just the, the animals continue perhaps on the planet's surface for a while and then the sun gets bigger and they all die and there's perhaps no more life anywhere um, in the whole universe. So, uh, if, so our soaring potential is kind of reduced to just this kind of one world that's kind of uh, mediocre. Uh, or that would also be somewhat true if there was this collapse of civilization that we couldn't recover from, uh, where, uh, you know, there's still different futures that are available and we could do a bit better or a bit worse. We could have better lives or worse lives. But a whole lot of like what could be achieved um, over billions of years or trillions of years and with, with, with galaxies as our canvas um, is all kind of gone. Uh, and 
and then also there's dystopian futures as well. Um, maybe those futures could could reach these kinds of cosmological scales, but it might even be a bad thing if they did. Um, you know, it might be that this this world that they've created has very little value in it. Perhaps only the the ruthless uh, uh, leaders have you know actually much positive in their lives and most people are kind of close to zero or something like that or so very low complexity society. yeah there, there could be all kinds of lenses you could see it through where, where it doesn't sound very good there, there are not many lenses you could see it through really where it does sound any good at all yeah. um whether that's thinking about kind of the creations in art or science and knowledge and learning or happiness or, or anything it, it looks pretty bad uh so uh but what they've got in common yeah is that that we're trapped we've lost this vast potential and instead we're we're trapped in some kind of like locked in state uh that is bad and will perpetuate forever and so in all of these cases uh what we'd need to do is to uh is to act now um it's only before we get locked into this state uh, that you can make any difference um and we can preserve this potential that we have uh so that our our children or grandchildren or distant descendants can fulfill that potential and and do something really amazing with it uh so I look at these different risks and I, I show how humanity has always been vulnerable to risks of extinction. Um, uh, but we can use uh, the the fact that we've uh, we've survived for two hundred thousand years so far as some evidence, uh, two thousand centuries that we've got through, that the background rate of extinction events is not that high. Um, and we can also use the extinction rates for other similar animals and so on and try to build up a better picture of that. Uh, and all of that suggests, uh, my, my best guess, is that there's about a 1 in 10,000 chance per century um, that humanity will go extinct from, from natural events. Another way to look at that is that, on average, we could last about a million years. And that's the typical length of time a species lasts on Earth. Um, but, uh, you know, more recently, uh, particularly with the development of nuclear weapons, uh, humanity's escalating power has finally reached this point where we can do such vast effects uh, that we could uh, we could destroy ourselves, uh, and we've entered this this time period that I call the precipice, uh, where um, you know we were just talking about the the effectable universe and kind of all of these things that we could ever reach and this kind of potentially vast future kind of has to go through this this kind of choke point. Um, and my analogy is, is you know, we're on this journey uh, as humanity and we're, we've come to this, the, the only way forward is this narrow path along a cliffside where, where a single misstep, uh, you could, we could fall down and, and never be able to recover. Uh, and that this is the most dangerous part of our journey so far. Uh, and, uh, but it, 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 it can't go on forever. Um, uh, and as, as I said, or as you said, uh, my estimate ultimately for the, the existential risk this century is about one in six. Uh, and I think it's been, you know, it was, it was smaller last century. And if we don't get our act together, it would be even bigger uh, next century. Uh, and so this is an unsustainable amount of risk. It's not that we could be, we could survive for a thousand centuries with risk like this. It's just the probabilities don't work out. Um, so either we will go extinct uh, this century or, or one of the next few or, or in some other way through a totalitarian regime or something, have, have our potential kind of snuffed out. Um, or we will get our act together and uh, work out how to reduce these risks and actually take this seriously. Uh, and that's, that's what I hope will happen. <laughs> and um, uh, at the moment, it, it's very hard to give precise estimates to how much we spend on existential risk um, because it's, it's a bit debatable as to what counts. Um, does all spending on climate change count because climate change is potentially an existential risk? Well, probably not all spending on it because most of that's not directed at this scenario at all. Um, but I think we can safely say uh, that we spend uh, less on uh, avoiding existential risk than we do on ice cream uh, each year. And I think that that's, that's a useful analogy because a lot of people think, well, you know, are you saying we should we should put everything in service of like survival so that we can do this thing and sacrifice the current generation on the altar of the future and so on. And it's like, well, the least I'm saying is we should spend more on it than on ice cream because like that's... Right. Uh, so that, yeah, that's kind of how I'm, how I'm thinking about it, that make it an actual priority. Um, and we can't say that it's an actual priority while it's a, a lower priority than ice cream uh, consumption. Yeah, it's, it seems like people at the moment are very, it, it, there's almost like an addiction to pessimism in some way. And people um, don't want to entertain these far future scenarios because they're, they're so, you know, understandably, there's a lot of bad stuff happening in the world right now. But, it, you know, there, there's a, there should be an appropriate amount of focus on that compared to the amount of, uh, you know, the presumed badness if 
we do as a species just suddenly disappear or get permanently curtailed by some authoritarian regime um because the amount of value loss there if you sort of integrate it under that curve over time is astronomical in comparison to you know the the sort of current day issues that are sort of absorbing most of our funds and resources and attention to be honest um so no i'm 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 deeply in agreement um and yeah, I guess I guess what I liked about your paper um, and generally the work that also Anders, who I, I did an interview with um, for this channel, uh, is you, you guys focus on um, sort of the utopian scenarios um, because we, we need, you know, we need to think about the possible dystopian scenarios and these existential risks, obviously, um, sort of acting as sticks, driving us forward. But we also need some carrots to sort of tantalize us and give us give us some hope and excitement of like, well, look, this is also what we, you know, we, we this is the potential that we could achieve. Um, and that's what I like about your paper, because it's 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 giving people this big picture thinking in it through an optimistic lens, which I think is arguably more constructive. Yeah. And it's the thing that also drives all of our work on um, on existential risk uh, is this hope for the future. Uh, and it's something where I. Uh, yeah, I think overall um, we're pretty optimistic people, uh, and it's because we we think the future um, could be so much better than the present uh, that where you know it would be such a tragedy to lose it, uh, and that we you know and also this realization that you know that there are high risks at the moment, and that only people of our time could do something about them means that we live at this kind of uniquely high leverage time, uh, and you know I I, I say uh, in the book that I think. If we do survive this time um, and uh, and live out, you know, at least the the, the time span of a typical species, uh, say a million years, um, uh, or maybe maybe we last as long as the uh, the horseshoe crab um, and last for several hundred million years, or, you know, or perhaps even longer. But if we last at any of these time spans, um, that people will look back and let's say over the last million years, um, when pe- when children are learning about their history, uh, that that our time period uh, will be uh, the uniquely important one. Uh, and so it may be that <laughs> maybe uh, like how we think about the Middle Ages and make all of these anachronistic kind of statements, they, they'll probably get some things wrong. Um, but uh, but I think that particularly from the, from the time period from nuclear weapons uh, till whenever we get our act together uh, and actually start uh, lowering these risks and putting in place the kind of institutions and uh, international cooperation that's needed to keep them low uh, forever, uh, that this time period that I call the precipice will be uh, yeah, uniquely important. So what advice would you give to anyone who's watching this who um, is both excited about the long-term future and concerned, as they should be, about the various existential risks uh, facing us over the next few decades? Um, what can they do? How, how can they get involved? Yeah, um, I, I think there's there's various ways to get involved. It's it's tricky at the moment because we're still at an early stage of kind of coming to grips with these things and understanding them. Uh, I think uh, reading some some more on this is a very very smart approach, um, and uh, I think my book, The Precipice, is uh, is a good place to start. Uh, also. Um, uh, Will McCaskill has a forthcoming book. I think he's just putting the, the finishing touches on it now, so maybe it, people have to kind of remember this one. Um, but he's writing a book on long-termism, uh, so this general approach that includes, uh, you know, uh, to how, what can we do now um, to improve things over the long-term future, and how could you know we generally get this kind of integral of benefits over large periods of time? Um, perhaps there are. Uh, avoiding existential risks is one kind of long-term focused action that could be very good, but maybe there are others as well, such as uh, uh, making discoveries uh, or avoiding kind of smaller forms of lock-in. Uh, maybe there are ways that that we get trapped in these kind of suboptimal futures that are very hard to escape from. So he's trying to explore kind of more of that. I think that that would be great. Um, and uh, there's there's a vibrant community of people uh, looking at these things. Uh, if, if one searches for long-termism on the internet, you'll probably find some of it. Uh, and then the Effective Altruism Forum is a, is a place that people discuss a lot of these things as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that, that it could certainly do with, <laughs> we'll need many more people uh, interested in these things. Right, because we always have, um, you know, well, there's very little money compared to many other issues um, being, being spent on these. We're we're also, we've sort of got a, 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 the main restriction is almost brain power, mm-hmm. right? There's just, there's, 
not that many very, very smart people in the world and a much smaller fraction of that, of those people are actually working on these particular issues. Um, in fact, some of the very smart ones are actually working on things that are accelerating some of these risks. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, and so in terms of uh, careers, you know, uh, a lot a lot of uh, people watching this might be kind of near the start of their careers or, or choosing an area in university. Uh, and so I think that there's a group called 80,000 Hours um, being roughly the length of a career, um, with the idea being you probably should spend at least a few hours <laughs> thinking about what you do with your career if they're going to be spending 80,000 hours advancing whatever that was. Um, uh, they've thought a lot about this question, about the, the brain power type question. You know, how could people have careers that, that really help with these things? Uh, so they've got a lot of information about that, which includes directly working on some of these areas. Uh, and it also includes uh, things like... Uh, uh, earning earning money so that you can uh, give it away in order to help with the funding of, of some of these things. So there's there's lots of different options there, uh, and uh, you know one that I think is kind of important is questions about uh, government policy and some of these risks, particularly with AI, and that that's something where. Uh, often the people in industry just bemoan the inability of people in the civil service uh, to know what, what's going on and regulate it properly. Uh, and that's largely because people who studied computer science don't go into the civil service. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, there's this kind of funny thing where people who are in the know bemoan the fact that this other group of people, uh, you know, doesn't know enough. But they that they never went there. I mean, you know, it's one of these things. You know, if you keep choosing to all cluster together, you can't bemoan the fact the other right. cluster doesn't have people like you in it. Um, you, that's that's actually yeah, your you fault. Divide not, and conquer. It's perhaps your fault more than their fault. Um, so I think that's something where uh, where we could do a lot more to have um, people with policy knowledge and interest within uh, the technical communities, but also people with technical knowledge and interest within the policy communities and, ha and kind of get those, those bridges uh, built better. And I think that a lot of what we'll need to do will ultimately be international coordination uh, because these are things that, uh, these existential risks uh, affect the whole world. Uh, and so uh, if something goes wrong just in one country, it could, it could go wrong everywhere. Uh, so we'll need a lot of international coordination uh, to try to sort this out. And we've seen with things like um, uh, like climate change, that's very difficult to do. It's, it's possible, but difficult within the current frameworks. But maybe we could we could build better international institutions for dealing with this and make improvements of other sorts. So we also need smart people to be going into that kind of international relations. Um, Toby, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I think I think we've uh, I think we've covered uh, <laughs> covered almost well, everything. We've covered there. a lot of ground. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, awesome. It's uh, it's it's been been great to have the chance to talk to you this morning.